and welcome to Project HR, a podcast dedicated to building better workplaces. Project HR is brought to you by Projections, an IRI company. IRI helps organizations navigate workplace challenges, improve employee engagement and productivity, manage labor relations, and implement effective communication strategies to achieve their goals. For more information, you can visit us online at projectionsinc.com and iriconsultants.com. I am Jennifer Oroqua, Director of Business Development for IRI and your host for today's episode of Project HR. To begin, let's face some basic facts. You're not going to like everyone that you work with, and newsflash, not everyone's going to like you. But you still have to work together to form a functioning team in order to meet your company's goals. And that can be easier said than done, especially in today's divided social and political landscape. The key to making it work is communication, being able to cut through all the noise and truly connect with coworkers and clients in a meaningful, productive way. Happily, in this episode, I'm speaking with some folks who can help us make these connections. My guests today are Jennifer Edwards and Katie McCleary, and together they are the authors of a new book called Bridge the Gap, Breakthrough Communication Tools to Transform Work Relationships from Challenging to Collaborative. Jennifer, Katie, it's so great to have you on Project HR. Oh, we're so happy to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you indeed. So I appreciate the fact that you acknowledge the need to bridge the gaps in your very own relationship as co-authors. Was that an inspiration for this book? Oh, absolutely. So Jennifer and I met in a women's leadership circle, and we both had successful practices and businesses of our own, and we were each writing our own book. And we really connected, but one of the most surprising things was just how incredibly different we are from personality to skill set. For example, Jennifer is a conservative and I'm a liberal. Mm -hmm. I'm a Buddhist. She's a Christian. I show up more as a creative. She shows up more as an executive. And um, when we began to look at our curriculum and the books that we were each working on, when you merge that together, wow, that is absolutely where the magic happened because it was how do I communicate across the gaps between us? And this all happened under, you know, the pandemic and political fraughtness. And we use our own tools every single day as work wives, because that's what we are now. We're work wives. And we use our tools every single day to show up, to work together, to collaborate. So we love basically sending these tools out into the world to help others. So in the book, and, and you, you alluded to it just there, you definitely spell out those larger external forces that are currently making it so hard to make these connections. Can you share a little bit about that? Yes. Um, well, throw in a pandemic that mm-hmm. none of us have ever experienced. And with that, the social isolation mm-hmm. and just the changes in how we did business, that force itself interrupted um, so much of what we qualified as a norm. And then throw in, in addition to that, the fact that we've got four generations of people waking up, going to work, leading, communicating, connecting, and they're all so different. Mm -hmm. That force itself was was and is fairly um, substantial. And then, uh, Jennifer, I'm sure you've noticed, but when you're doing your podcast, for example, the personal and the professional are intermingling like in ways we never thought. Mm -hmm. Seeing people in their homes, pictures, um, we're really connecting with the more holistic version of a person than we ever have before. And it is changing the way we communicate, connect, and understand what it means to work with the whole human. And you would think by that, we would all be a little bit more of accepting of one another. So why do we have such a difficult time communicating with people we don't understand or like, or maybe even respect? Well, we have those external forces, right? We're all under a lot of pressure. We're all managing new ways of being. But at the same time, we live in a human suit. We're zipped into it and we can't escape it. And so when we're met with people who are very different than us, for a spectrum of things, we we just naturally struggle to connect. We do. And so we have to work a little bit harder. And the older that we get, and all the science and research shows this, we actually lessen our ability to want to bridge a gap. We lessen our ability to want to show up as, you know, the leader or the adult in the relationship and say, hey, like we can get through this together. It just lessens over time because of our human suit. Mm -hmm. And so how would you rate our, our overall communication skills in the workplace in general? You know, that's a great question and I can't give a blanket answer. But one thing we notice time and time again is as goes the leader, so goes the organization, mm-hmm. especially in communication. So 
once you find a leader in an organization that's committed to curiosity as their tool of leadership, that's really important. We find that communication is much more transparent, authentic, and actually a tool. Yeah, communication is actually a tool that they use to optimize performance and collaboration in the workplace. So communication is at very least a two-way street. So if only one person in a team commits to being more skilled at it, will that commitment make an impact on its own? It will, and it oftentimes takes two really committed people to turn an organization, a team, a problem, a dilemma around. However, what we know is wherever you go, there you are. If you take responsibility for you to show up curious, and we call it clean, kind of like that clean eating craze going across America, if you can actually show up clean in how you listen, how you communicate, and how you leverage curiosity, you can make a difference in any conversation. But Katie, we know that sometimes it's too hard because people, not everyone wants to be connected with. Not everyone wants to be communicated with in the same way. All right, Katie, Jennifer, I need to take a quick sponsorship break right now. But when we return, I want to talk about how we can begin improving our communication skills and making those connections. Stay with us. Your frontline leaders need skills and knowledge to support your organization's growth. They've got to motivate their team, support employees when they struggle, and connect with their people, all while continually improving their own skills. To help make your organization more successful, the A Better Leader team has created a free guide to selecting and educating your leaders. Before you hire another supervisor, before you give another merit-based promotion, read this practical guide. The Four Qualities That Make Great Leaders provides practical tips on creating better leaders for your organization. The free guide also includes actionable steps on testing potential hires for these qualities during the hiring process so your supervisors have what they need from day one. Download this guide now at projectionsinc.com slash a better leader. You'll be glad you did. I'm back now with Jennifer Edwards and Katie McCleary, the authors of Bridge the Gap, Breakthrough Communication Tools to Transform Work Relationships from Challenging to Collaborative. And I want to start by addressing the fact that a lot of what's going on getting in the way of our ability to connect is biological. Can you explain that? Yeah. So um, we really believe in priming people to connect, which is that I have to understand how am I showing up to the conversation? And notoriously, we are really bad judges of that. We're really bad judges of looking in the mirror and saying, how am I showing up? Right. And could I show up better? One of the things that is getting in our way is this little tiny almond shape piece of biology that you have living in your brain called the amygdala. And we have personified the amygdala um, in a clever way. We call her Amy. And Amy is your frenemy. She's your best friend and your enemy. She's keeping you safe. And even though we live in this evolved culture, in this digitized space, and we know a lot more than we ever did before, Amy is still riding shotgun with you at all times. She wants to know, am I safe? And for us, safety means meeting those emotional needs that every single human has on the planet. And those are to be understood, to be valued, and to be accepted for who we are. If those three emotional needs are not being met, Amy is triggering a biological reaction in you that says, hey, you're not safe here. And those chemicals that she's pouring into your body, which um, are clouding up the way in which you show up, they're clouding up the way in which you communicate. And so that is sort of biologically what we're under all the time. And most people aren't even aware of it. They're not aware that we're just shooting ourselves in our foot when we want to do good work and be with people. And yet we're just anxious and stressed out about it. That's Amy. And I love that personification, the idea of Amy. And I've been using it actually myself with my 18 year old, because I'm, I'm thinking it's not her. It's Amy. Amy is stressing out. Amy is, you know, under, under conditions that she's not used to having. So I love that. But clearly there are psychological factors here at work as well. And so one of those factors is described in your book as the single key factor needed to bridge that gap. Can you share that with us? Yeah. So there was this really great study that was done um, by researchers of over 44,000 individuals. And they basically wanted to know 
what makes for a healthy relationship. And it all boiled down to one thing, and that is psychological flexibility. One person in a relationship has to be psychologically flexible, which means that they're willing to be curious about what they don't know that they don't know, that they will meet that other person to their sense of right before they kind of break down the whole relationship altogether. So one person has to be psychologically flexible. And that psychological flexibility is a choice. For us, it's are you aware enough that you're not being psychologically flexible? Mm. Can you travel to that other space of right for that person to understand them better? And that's really where the magic of a good communicative and collaborative relationship starts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. So I love the example you used to illustrate psychological flexibility, the story about the restaurant client. Can you share that? Yeah, it's a great story. Um, You know, coming into the pandemic, we had one way of doing things oftentimes. And once we got full deep into the pandemic, that one way we existed before didn't seem to work quite so well. Mm. And so the really thriving organizations coming out of the pandemic actually had psychological flexibility. They were able to rethink and repackage their product, in this case, a restaurant, um, to meet the needs of the current environment and client. And it was phenomenal. This restaurant owner um, ran a phenomenal business. And when nobody could come in, they sat down as a team and said, what can we do? And they shifted radically. They like, well, let's offer cooking classes. Let's sell some um, flour and eggs at our business. Let's become a service to the community. And Jennifer, this never would have been thought about if the pandemic hadn't forced them to think outside of their existing box. And specifically, we went to them and said, hey, what would happen if we actually threw out the playbook, brought in psychological flexibility and said, what don't we know we don't know? that might really transform this for us. And man, they've been an inspiration to so many of our other clients because they were brave. Yeah. So what role does personal responsibility play in communication? That's a great question. Personal responsibility for us, for Katie, for myself, is where it all starts. Hmm. I said before that expression that um, wherever I go, there I am. Mm -hmm. And it continues to this expression. Therefore, I am an instrument of change. Whatever event happens in my life, I get to choose my response and that impacts the outcome. I love saying as well, Katie, I talk a lot that we have authorship in our life. We have a choice to see who's in front of us, what's happening and respond with dignity, with warmth, with curiosity, with care in all situations. And so for us in the end, I need to be the instrument of change I want to see in the world, in the business, and in my community. And you you mentioned this a couple of times as we've gone through the, the role of curiosity in communication, but what does that really mean in practice? How, how can we be more curious in our communications? So we just preach this phrase all the time, which is show up curious. And showing up curious doesn't mean that you're going to go hammer or pepper someone with a bunch of questions. You're actually not going to ask the word why. Ever in our curious conversations method, which is found in the book. Curiosity is an energy. It is, um, it's an approach where you want to be open, present, listening, and focused on learning and being with that other person so that you can truly understand their perspective. And so it requires a lot of suspension of your own self suspending your personality, suspending your agenda, suspending your emotional need to be right, to be seen as smart, to be seen as clever. It is really about saying, hey, I'm here and I'm curious. And so we put in the book a lot of things about the neuroscience of curiosity and how you can operationalize it as a tool. And that's probably the most effective strategy is am I showing up curious? And what's the language that I'm using that will dive us into a curious conversation where we can all learn something in a calm, productive manner? 
That's a fantastic approach. All right. I'm going to ask you, what is the shared egg? Ah, we love the shared egg. (laughs) Um, When it all comes down to it, we know that relationships are all about trust and respect. If I trust and respect you, that's a form of love. It means that I will give you my blood, sweat, and tears if I know that if I take a risk, if we have a breakdown, uh, if you're asking me to try something new, if I trust and respect you, then I will do a lot of things with you and we can collaborate. So the shared egg is that you have a nest. Me and you, we have a nest together. We do this work and there's an egg in it. And we have to tend to this egg of trust and respect. How am I showing up to trust and respect you? And how are you showing up to trust and respect me? And when a crack gets in that egg, it's time for us to have a meeting together about how we're communicating. How are we being curious with one another? What's the breakdowns that we're having or the miscommunications? And how can we tend to our egg better so that it can, you know, basically hatch and grow and blossom into its own, you know, life force of its own? All right, Katie, Jennifer, I'm going to take some time out for another quick break. We're going to be right back after this. You're listening to the Project HR Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Oroqua, and my guests today are Jennifer Edwards and Katie McCleary, authors of Bridge the Gap, Breakthrough Communication Tools to Transform Work Relationships from Challenging to Collaborative. And we are back. Now, there's no denying that we're all living in a very polarized world right now. Communication is likely more challenging now than it's ever been in our lifetimes. You guys talked about at the beginning of the different generations in the workplace as well. So what's one thing I can do today to improve communication with someone whose values or perspectives seem diametrically opposed to my own? Be with them. People are always looking to be accepted, to be understood, and to be valued And people want to build a shared experience, a bridge with you, even if their values are diametrically opposed. They, we know, Jennifer, that what separates us is oftentimes much smaller than what unites us. And Mm -hmm. people do want to be connected. We're, We're knit that way in our DNA. That's how we are created is to connect. So be with someone, be willing to hear about their lived experience. Being willing to hear what's true for them and suspend your own judgment. And in doing that, you may learn something that you didn't know you didn't know and connect with them even better. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a second. Are there times when even our best efforts to communicate won't succeed? Absolutely. So I'm on vacation right now with my family. And last night, my daughter and I went down to the hot tub and we love going to the hot tub because we get to meet people from all around the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, there was a a daughter and a man sitting in the hot tub. And this couple was nothing like me and my daughter politically. And they really wanted to talk to us about their political beliefs and their agenda and their news sources. Mm -hmm. And um, my daughter and I practice what we preach. We showed up curious and we listened and we listened to understand and we don't agree with them. At the end of the day, at the end of that conversation, there was absolutely nothing almost for us to connect about except for what was at stake for both of us. Hmm. And what we both heard in that um, monologue, because they were talking at us, they weren't Mm -hmm. talking with us, Mm -hmm. was that what's at stake for them is their freedom. And when we began to understand where they come from, where they live, their community, also what their jobs were, um, they feel as if freedoms have been absolutely taken away. And when you sit inside their story, they're right. Hmm. But that's not my sense of right. That's not my story. It's not my community or where I live. And so we're going to come across this more and more and more, especially in the workplace as we all begin returning to work and remote work lessons. And it's that I don't have to, I don't have to engage in a conversation where my values are going to be thrashed and hacked and someone's just talking at me. So we give in the book a bunch of sentence starters and ways in which you can approach a person where communication is just not going to succeed. Mm-hmm. And so how will you um, how will you do that 
and create a better paradigm for you to engage with them, especially at work where you can't, for lack of a better term, get rid of them. (laughs) And so we give these sort of roadmaps to do that. And it's really clear. And to be clear is to be kind. And last night in that hot tub, I could have reacted. I could have roared after Hmm. them. I have no desire to ruin their vacation. And frankly, I have no desire to ruin my vacation. So all that energy is just junk. Mm -hmm. So I listened and I said, thanks for sharing. And then I, um, I said, I would love for you to consider this one idea. And I shared a story of mine and they, they heard me, but they would not have heard me if I did not hear them first. Mm -hmm. For sure. So yeah, I want to go back to that. You mentioned the sentence starters and and this book is really a, a how-to guide. You know, it's much more actionable than theoretical. Why did you take that approach? Because we need to make things simple. There's a lot of theory out there. There's a lot of um, concepts, constructs. What we wanted to provide was boots on the ground, simple things we can do to transform the way we connect. So we've put the book into two main parts. First part is focusing on self. How can I optimize myself? How can I prime myself to show up as clean as possible, to be as curious as possible, and to be aware that when Amy hijacks me, how do I disrupt my biology and get back to present so that my executive function, that part of the brain that's responsible for logic and curiosity and creativity, so that it can show up optimally? And then the second half of the book, we talk a lot about understanding the brain in front of you, the individual, what their needs are, how they would best be communicated with. And we really use practical stories. There have got to be over 30 or 40 stories in here. You will see yourself somewhere in a story, a case study, and be able to say, yeah, I too could do that. I too could bridge a gap by changing the way I connect. I use language. And most importantly, how my energy shows up to invite another kindly into a real great conversation and connection to enhance how we all collaborate in the workplace. And one thing I noticed is that it really speaks to people at all levels and all capacities in a company, sort of like the the encounter in the hot tub. Why was it important for you for the book to be so inclusive? We're all leaders. We're leaders both at home, we're leaders in the workplace. We're leaders in the community. We're leaders. And every single one of us have a responsibility if we truly want to lead this work world, this nation, our families, our communities into greater connection to show up curious. And so, heck, whether you're a mom, an entrepreneur, an executive, a leader, a team member, this book is for you. It will show you how to get curious and to Mm -hmm. radically transform connection. Love that. And the the book is, we talked about this just a second ago, but the book is full of practical exercises and case studies. Why was that important to include in, in Bridging the Gap? So that was so important for us because we wanted to speak to that everyday professional. We love reading books and we love thought leaders, but so much of it is really abstract. Mm -hmm. It's like you'll read 20 pages on, hey, you need to listen better. But how do I listen better, mm-hmm. right? For sure. And people, people need metaphors, analogies, and stories that they can relate to in the challenging times that we're living in today with so many different generations. Everybody has a different way to connect. And so we wanted to make this book bright and colorful, easy to read, and it really is for anyone because mm-hmm. we truly believe that you can be a leader in your relationship. You really can. You don't have to wait for your leader or boss to tell you. This is a book for everyone. Now, Katie, I don't want to finish this episode out without acknowledging the fact that your voice may very well sound familiar to our listeners because you are the host of NPR Cap Radio's The Drive podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I love having this podcast. So what we do is we interview pretty high profile leaders about their personal story, their backstory, where they grew up. Because if I know anything after 20 years, and Jennifer knows this too, if you're the leader, 
you're the channel. All of your leadership tools and tactics pretty much come from how you grew up. You're either doing things because they worked for you when they grew up, or you're doing things um, as a rejection of how you grew up. Hmm. So your backstory really matters. And we glean leadership lessons from it all the time. Love that. All right. If I wanted to find out more about the two of you or about Bridging the Gap, where can I go? It's easy. You can go to howtobridgethegap.com. That's our website. We are all over social. We love engaging on LinkedIn. And um, we just love talking to people too. Love that. Just a reminder to everyone that those links will all be included in this episode's companion guide. So be sure to unlock that today at projectionsinc.com slash podcast. Right now, though, Katie, Jennifer, it is time for our lightning round questions. And these are questions we ask of every guest of the podcast. Are you both ready? Ready. All yep. right. All right, here we go. The first question is a topic showdown. In this episode, we've been talking about driving workplace communication. So with that in mind, and this is for both of you, in your opinion, which of these methods of communication is most ineffective in the workplace, smoke signals or carrier pigeons? Smoke signals. I would also say smoke signals because that's a reactive tendency. Help, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. It's like, okay, take a breath, calm down. What are you in trouble about communicating? Perfect. Love it. What's the best book that you've read recently? And both of you. Just picked it up. Power of Regret, Daniel Pink. Amazing. I love Effortless by Greg McEwen. Nice. All right. What is your favorite thing about the work that you do? Love learning about what I don't know I don't know. I'm kind of a knowledge junkie. I really love helping people make super small shifts um, that use transparency and clarity in order for them to not make things so hard for themselves. I like that. All right. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Listen, it has the same letters as the word silent in it. My favorite piece of advice is that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I like that. All right. Last question. Who or what inspires you? First responders and teachers. I think who really inspires me are those people that are getting up at 530 in the morning every single day, working out, eating a healthy breakfast, going to work, coming home at five and then tending to their families. It's a lot. Yep crazy dedication. Thank you both for joining me today on this week's episode of Project HR. It has been a pleasure to have both of you on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to you to our listeners. Once again, this is your reminder to grab that companion guide for this episode at projectionsinc.com slash podcast. If you'd like to be on Project HR or you know someone who would, feel free to email us at projecthr at projectionsinc.com. And last, but certainly not least, to make sure you never miss an episode of Project HR, I hope you subscribe to the podcast. Drop us a line, leave us a review, or give us a handful of stars wherever you get your content. That's it for me for now. Let's make it a great day at work. <laughs>